Most people who aren't fans of electronic music are probably completely unaware of some of your favorite artists, but every now and then someone comes along and smashes right through the obscurity of the electronic music scene to emerge on the other side as a vaguely known pseudo-celebrity. We've seen this happen with Tiesto, Marshmello, The Chainsmokers, Skrillex, and quite a few others, including our favorite mouse helmet DJ, Deadmau5, who clearly looks nothing like the animated mouse who will not be named due to fear of legal repercussions. Deadmau5 is one of the main pioneers who helped push electronic music to its current levels of notoriety. If you first got into electronic music anytime between 2000 and 2010, there was a good chance that Daft Punk, Justice, Tiesto, or Deadmau5 served as your introduction to the genre. In this video, we'll be taking a deep dive into the backstory of how a young tech enthusiast from Niagara Falls became one of the biggest names in electronic music. You know, you're not Tiesto. You're right. I'm fucking dead mouse. <laughs> Joel Zimmerman was born and raised in Niagara Falls, Ontario. His mother was a visual artist, and his father worked at a General Motors plant. He's an auto manufacturer guy. He worked at General Motors, you know, he, he drove around tow motors, and he was just, man's man, you know, like, and, and we weren't very, very, um, lower middle class upbringing. His mom bought him an Atari when he was five years old, and he quickly became obsessed with it. By the time he was eight years old, he had begun taking piano lessons after school, mostly just so he had something to do while his parents were still at work. Yeah, okay, I mean, there's a, definitely a music element in that, of course. Uh, yeah, you know, I, no since doubt. I was eight, you know, my parents put me in like piano boot camp after school. So between the time, hours of like three and when they got off at work, I was classically trained the whole time. Wow. Okay. Eventually, he started to take up an interest in computers. And from a young age, he knew that he wanted to work with computers when he grew up. By the time he was a teenager, he had begun to take up an interest in electronic music. So he began producing with a multi-track music sequencer called Impulse Tracker. <laughs> Being a curious kid, he decided to go to a local computer repair shop in Niagara Falls called Cyberdyne Systems, and he asked the employees if they knew anything about making music with computers. The owner came out to talk to him, and he said that he knew a little bit about it, and he recommended that Joel try a software called Cakewalk, which was developed by Band Labs. The owner also happened to be a DJ who put on a local radio mix show with some of his other DJ friends, so he invited Joel to come hang out while they record one day. This became a regular thing for Joel, and after a few months of watching them produce the show, he began to grasp the ins and outs of how everything was done. Eventually, once Joel gained enough experience, the owner would ask him to step in and make various edits whenever he had to be at the computer shop. Later on, one of the other DJs who worked on the show opened up a record shop with a studio in the back, so Joel would skip school to hang out there and improve his production skills. I spent so much time in that fucking studio learning shit and, and downloading stuff and, you know, putting together things and learning to make music and all that stuff that I was like, I, you couldn't, you couldn't get me out of that fucking studio. Like my mom would be calling like, where's Joel? You got to come home. No, no, no. I was um, producing or learning to produce. Not, not I, I didn't turn out a fucking tune in the first six years of my like kind of just hanging out and learning. Eventually the record shop went out of business so Joel had to figure his life out and he ended up working a few different jobs one of which was at a t-shirt print shop. It was just literally you know putting drawing logos in uh, Illustrator and then printing them and then going to a press and then doing that and then bringing them da literally down to the store and just selling them out of a storefront. He then worked a job canning peaches, which he said is the worst job that he has ever had. And to this day, he still hates peaches. I got my peaches out in Georgia. With the money he saved up from the jobs, he was able to buy a CPU powerful enough to work on music production at home. Around that time, his parents were really pushing him to get his life together, so he taught himself web design and started making money with that. Through web design, he discovered royalty-free sound libraries where people could pay for a license to use the music on their websites, and he saw an opportunity to make music for those libraries and get paid for it. After doing that for a while, he decided that he wanted to get his hands on professional studio equipment that was way out of his price range, so he began shadowing a local audio engineer. 
One day when he was in the studio with the engineer, there was a band there called the Revenge of the Egg People, and they took an interest in the electronic music that Joel was making, so they asked him to do a remix that would be featured on their upcoming album. Joel decided to use the name Karma K to remix a track called I'm Electric, which was Joel's first official release ever. I'm electric. As time went on, he continued to hone in on his skills while simultaneously experimenting with new audio software that was being introduced to the market. He interacted with other producers and software developers on various music production forums where he would also share his music and he became quite well known in these various forums. One of the forums that he was active in was based around ImageLine's digital audio workstation software called Fruity Loops, which is actually now called FL Studio because they were sued by Kellogg's who makes Fruit Loops cereal. Now obviously, FL Studio and ImageLine are both very well known today, but at this particular point in time, ImageLine was just a very young company and they were still refining Fruity Loops. Since Joel was active on the forum, he would give valuable feedback to the software developers on how to improve the software. His perspective was unique because he approached things partially from a producer point of view, and many of the ImageLine software developers were not actually musicians themselves, they were only programmers. These forums played a big role in shaping the early beginnings of his career as Deadmau5 for a various number of reasons. And of those reasons, one of the most well-known ones is how he got his name Deadmau5. He went to change the video card in his computer one day and found a dead mouse inside, so he shared the story with everyone on the forum, and they all started calling him the dead mouse guy. Because of this, he decided to change his username to dead mouse, spelled the normal way, but due to character limitations, he used the spelling that we know it as today. Joel also met Steve Duda on the ImageLine forum, who he would later go on to release music with, and for those that don't know, Steve Duda is the creator of Serum, which is probably the most used synth in EDM by a long shot. We'll talk more about Steve Duda in a little bit, but for now, let's keep it moving. Since Joel was so helpful to the developers at ImageLine, they wanted to fly him out to Belgium to work at the ImageLine headquarters for a year, and he took them up on the offer. He lived in a flat with one of the developers in Ghent, Belgium, and he also didn't have a visa in order to be in Belgium for an extended period of time, so ImageLine technically sorta of smuggled him into the country. He ended up getting sick while he was there, and he wasn't on ImageLine's medical insurance, so he ended up flying home to go to a hospital, which ended his stint in Belgium, though he did continue assisting them from home in Canada. I know that there are 45,000 in America who die waiting because they don't have insurance at all. I'm here to talk about Canadian healthcare. Now around this same time, he had developed a relationship with Jay Gordon, the lead singer of Orgy, which was an industrial rock band from Los Angeles. Steve Duda, who is also from California, was actually the one who had put the two in touch. Orgy wanted Joel to come to Los Angeles to work for them, so Jay's dad, who was the band manager, wrote up a sketchy employee contract for Joel to show customs upon entering the US. The contract didn't end up getting accepted by customs, so he was sent back home, and the whole working for Orgy thing kinda just fell through. A few months later, Steve had asked Joel to come to LA for a week just to hang out. They had been friends via the internet for 5 or 6 years at that point, but they still hadn't met in person. So Joel tried to enter the US once again, and Customs asked him what he was going for, so he said it was to hang out with his friend Steve for a week. Customs was skeptical about how someone from Niagara Falls had a friend who lived thousands of miles away, and keep in mind this was in the late 90s. Joel explained to them that he knew Steve via the internet, but Customs believed that he was trying to illegally enter the country in order to work, even though that just wasn't the case. Unfortunately, this resulted in Joel being banned from entering the US for roughly 7 years. At this point in his life, Joel was already an experienced producer, but the only official release that he had was that Karma K remix, so it was time to start releasing originals. 
In 1999, he released a vinyl with Derek Caesar, who was one of the DJs from the local radio show that he used to work on. They used the name Dread and Karma, and the vinyl contained the singles I Don't Want No Other and Suck This. The vinyl is incredibly rare due to its obscurity, but there is currently a copy for sale on Discogs for $3,300. Three years later, in 2002, Joel created Deadmau5.com, and that same year, he had two tracks that made it onto a compilation CD called Section Z Volume 1. He used a different name for each track. One of the tracks is called Super Lover, and for that, he used Halcyon441 as the artist's name, but the other track is called My Opinion, and for that one, he used the name Dead mouse yeah well you know that's just like uh, your opinion man years later in 2005 the dead mouse project made its official debut with the release of his first studio album get scraped which sold about 500 physical copies 2005 was also the year that Joel and Steve Duda formed a duo called BSOD, which stands for Better Sounding on Drugs. The whole project was meant to be a joke, poking fun at how corny and formulaic dance music had become. And then for whatever reason, I said, we should do dance music. And then it was like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a joke, literally a joke. And uh, I was taking the piss. And then, then, then Steve got thinking, like, he's like, well, it's so fucking formulaic. Like, and I'm like, I know, right? Together, they made eight tracks in eight days and submitted them to Beatport. And I shit you not, the BSOD tracks, which was our moniker, were on the charts as number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of the top 10. Are you serious? I shit you not. It was the weirdest fucking thing. And we're like, why is this working? The most popular track was called This Is The Hook, and it had a robotic voice mockingly narrating every section of the song, explaining to the listener what is happening. This is the hook. It's catchy. You like it. Not much later, Joel and Steve were at Miami Music Week when Benny Benassi came up to them to tell them that he loved their track, This Is The Hook. Satisfaction. That was the moment that they realized they messed up, because the whole thing was supposed to be a joke, but they realized that it was actually being received as a very legitimate thing. After they had this realization, they decided to stop BSOD because it wasn't something that either of them actually wanted. After that, Joel continued on with Dead Mouse, and Steve began working on creating Serum, which obviously worked out extremely well for him. After BSOD broke up, Dead Mouse began releasing on a Canadian record label called Play Records, which was run by Melanie Brown, aka Melly Fresh, aka the voice actor for Cheer Bear from Care Bears. Dead Mouse had a few releases on Play Records in 2006. His Vexillology album and a handful of singles, two of which were collaborations with Melly Fresh. One of the singles released that year was Faxing Berlin, which could be considered his breakout track as it gained international recognition with the help of Chris Lake and Pete Tong. Because of Faxing Berlin, he got popular in England, but was still relatively unknown in Canada or the US. A little while after he had blown up in England, he was booked to play at a club in Toronto called Government, and people thought he was actually from the UK and didn't realize that he only lived about four blocks away from Government. Around that time, he self-released an album under the name Halcyon 441 called Dead Mouse Presents 1998 to 2002, which was a compilation of old tracks that were produced over the course of those five years. He also released various other tracks via Play Records over the years, but we won't get into those for a reason that's going to be mentioned later on in the video. In 2007, Dead Mouse launched his record label Mousetrap, which has been a major force in shaping the electronic music scene, exposing the world to now massive artists such as Skrillex and Rez. This is the fucked up thing. This is this is like some weird fate shit. I was on my way out of Ibiza to go to somewhere else in Europe. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a show. I, I can't remember where it was. Um, like after the Ibiza one, so we had to really like rush to get our connection in Madrid and then um, fly out elsewhere. And uh, we get to the airport. We're like about... 15 minutes before the next plane is now if you've ever been to the airport in madrid it's like it's like o'hare it's like crazy mm -hmm. long mm -hmm. and our flight that got in was way at the front and the flight that we were going right. to get on was way at the end and you no escalators no trains we had to fucking literally run to make mm -hmm. that fucking flight and it was like kind of a big deal of a show that there's just mm -hmm. no way we could fucking miss this so let's fucking just book it Fuck it, I swear to God, I've never run so fast in my life because, like, literally a lot of money was on the lines. I was like, ah, 
Oh, we gotta get that money. Gotta get that cheese. And then we get to the fucking thing. They're like doing the closed door thing. And we're like, fuck, serious? They were like, like, I mean, if you were like a minute, you know, we could let you on. But we've literally Mm. pulled the fucking thing off the flight. And it was like span air. So they had pulled the gate off the fucking thing. And we're like. Oh shit. Okay, well, let's start calling around, see if we can find some like private options, all this shit. And so we're just kind of fucking laying around in there waiting for like some kind of option to help. Flight goes up, fucking not even fucking like about 300 feet off the runway, plane crashes. Mm-hmm. Everyone on board dies. Now, aside from that, in 2008, things were beginning to go extremely well for Dead Mouse. He released what is arguably one of his most popular albums, random album title, and was off to the races playing flagship festivals like Coachella, Ultra, and Creamfields. He also dropped some major singles such as I Remember and Move For Me with Cascade, as well as one of his biggest tracks ever that he hates to play, Ghosts and Stuff with Rob Swire of Pendulum and Knife Party. 2008 was also the year that he began wearing the mouse helmet at his gigs, which was an idea that he had actually scoffed at in the past. Even though he was the one who had made the design for the helmet years before, it was actually Jay Gordon from Orgy who told him that he should wear it on stage whenever he performs, and this was years before he ever started playing gigs. He goes, dude, if you ever perform live, you gotta wear, you gotta make that and wear it. Jay Gordon told me that, and I, I said, you're you're a fucking loser, dude. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I swear to God, he was the first. I'll give him credit. He was saying, he goes, you know what? If you ever, if you ever, uh, if you ever make it, you know, like you, you should wear that on stage. I'm like, yeah, no, that's stupid. And then, and, but, but like, I'm, and, and it never happened to like five, six, seven years later. But like, honestly, it's, it's been in my brain the whole fucking time. Just never acted on it or whatever. And I started like, I, I first started using it as my logo as Dead Mouse when I registered all that shit. And I was like, fuck, maybe I should. So I go no to, kidding. I go to this guy in Toronto who makes props for like film and television. His name is Warren Keeler. And I, I said, can you make this? And I gave him, of course, the CADs, the FBX of everything. Cause I've modeled it in 3d and he's like, yeah, fuck. Gets a hamster ball, fucking does his thing, and makes a really nice one. I fucking throw it on, I'm like, fucking hey, this is so stupid. The first gig that he ever wore the helmet for was in Nova Scotia in 2008. And if all that wasn't enough, Deadmau5 formed a new group in 2008 as well. It's called WTF and consists of Joel, Steve Duda, DJ Arrow, and Joel's longtime friend Tommy Lee, who is also the drummer for Motley Crue, who was introduced to Joel by Steve in the early 2000s. It wasn't really a legit side project, more of a just for fun thing, and they didn't play their first show together until 2016, but they did release four tracks in 2008, but they haven't released anything since. The next year in 2009, Deadmau5 released For Lack of a Better Name, which contains another track that he can't stand playing. You guys wanna hear Stroke? Yeah, well after 20 years of doing this shit, I know. There's actually a 20 minute version of Strobe that has never been released. Another fun little fact about Strobe is that it was inspired by a VST plugin from F Expansion called Strobe, which is cool and all, but here's something really crazy. He almost decided to not release Strobe. My biggest hit, I almost shit canned. I, I did the guy, there was a guy at uh, Mousetrap uh, that was working for us named Harvey Tabman. Uh, he was my tour manager for like a little bit. I wrote Strobe uh, in a fucking hotel room at the Great Eastern Hotel in England. I had my computer and everything, and I just kind of did, it, did that track. And then I just basically kind of packaged it together with five other things that I just went here, guys. Listen to these. What do you? What's the taker? What are we? What are we doing here? And I had my money on this other one or something. And um, Harvey's like, oh. I'm Fucking love this one, this this strobe one. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not doing it. Nope, nope, I refuse. No, it's just I just it's not there for me. Like the sound and da da da. He's like, right, me, you got to put it out. And I'm like, no, dude, it's not happening. He badgered me for months, and then finally, when we had to we had to get something else out that I I literally ran out of options. I just gave in. I was like, fine, Harvey. And then we put it out and it just became my biggest fucking track. By this point in his career, Deadmau5 had become somewhat iconic in the public eye, so much so that he actually made a cameo in a 2009 episode of Gossip Girl. (laughs) 
He spoke about the experience in an interview saying, yeah, the Gossip Girl thing was kind of cool and all. I didn't have much of a clue at the time about what I was getting myself into and had a laugh when they sent hair and makeup to my trailer. They looked at me with a mouse head and turned straight around. Later on in the year, Deadmau5 began streaming himself working on new music, which has become a key part of his brand and something that he still does to this day. If there's one thing that Joel has always been consistent about, it's being ahead of the curve, as streaming was nowhere near its current levels of popularity. Boring. That's what it is. Joel talked about his decision to start streaming his work process in 2018 when he made an appearance on the H3 podcast. What was it about to, uh, about streaming early on when before it was popular that appealed um, to you? That, that was well, it wasn't it wasn't the concept of streaming. It was like, well, fuck streaming. I just mean like it would be really cool that you know because the nature of electronic music is all heavily produced, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, right? It's not recorded live off the floor by a bunch of talented musicians. It's mm. Like just, just whittling away, mm -hmm. doing multiple passes kind of thing. And and then it always just came out like, okay, here's DJ so-and-so with his new album, right? And 30 tracks. Mm -hmm. Where You know, I, I always thought, well, wouldn't it be really cool if everyone knew, you know, not, not like I have to expose anything, but I just mean it's really, be, it'd be cooler to like open up the hood on it and show people the process of right. it to, you know, either inspire or encourage other people to do it because it's like, oh, maybe that doesn't look so hard or right. that's an interesting way of doing things kind of thing. You know, just lifting the hood on it. When 2010 rolled around, Deadmau5 had the opportunity to perform at the MTV Music Awards, sporting an early version of his LED helmet. He also won three awards that night, one of which was presented to him by Tommy Lee. In an interview, Tommy said, It was such an epic night. He won like three awards and I got to give him one. And I'm just sitting there and I'm watching him up there. He's sweeping awards like crazy. I'm like, man, I remember this dude grubbing smokes from me. At Coachella that same year, Deadmau5 debuted his famous 360 degree rotating cube stage. The cube has been a key staple of his brand and he's been refining it ever since, but he doesn't use it for every show due to the grueling logistics of moving it around the world and he hasn't used it since 2020, but that doesn't mean that we won't see a new and improved version in the future. Towards the end of 2010, Deadmau5 released his third album in three years, 4 times 4 equals 12. One of the tracks on the album is called Cthulhu Sleeps, with the name being inspired by the author H.P. Lovecraft, and there's actually a pretty interesting connection with this song that has come full circle. So as we know, Skrillex released his Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites EP on Mousetrap in partnership with Big Beat Records, which catapulted him into the mainstream. Years later, Skrillex started Nest HQ, which is a subsidiary of Ausla, with the intention of signing relatively unknown talent. Rez, who is now a major artist herself, got her big break when Nest HQ signed her Insurrection EP in 2015, which got her a lot of attention from blogs, which Deadmau5 noticed, so he signed her to Mousetrap a year later. Rez started producing immediately after seeing a Deadmau5 set at Hard Summer in 2013, and she has said that her favorite Deadmau5 track is Cthulhu Sleeps due to its hypnotic nature, which is pretty much what she is now known for. Fast forward, and she has now collaborated with Deadmau5 on multiple occasions, including the formation of a duo but we'll be getting into that later. I say all of this to point out just how much of an influence Deadmau5 has had in shaping the modern day dance music scene, even if it goes somewhat unnoticed. Now let's take a little break from the timeline here to talk about all of the video game appearances that Deadmau5 has had over the years. Joel is known to be a bit of a gamer himself, so it's very fitting for him to have an absurd amount of cameos in various video games. First off is his music, which has been used in quite a long list of video games, from FIFA to Need for Speed, Grand Theft Auto, and many more. Getting your music in video games is cool and all, but it's also a fairly common occurrence with artists as big as Deadmau5. However, something that isn't nearly as common is getting your own playable character or any other sort of visual representation of your brand in a game, and Deadmau5 has a lot of these. He's an unlockable playable character in DJ Hero 2 and Family Guy The Quest for Stuff, and there's also a Deadmau5 skin in Minecraft. There are various other Deadmau5 themed items and power-ups in a handful of games such as PUBG, Ghosts and DJs, Goat Simulator, and Diablo 3. He even got his own radio station in Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars. He honestly might be the most referenced musician in video game history, but anyways, let's get back into his music career. 
Dead Mouse is no stranger to controversy, so it should come as no surprise that he was banned from Coachella in 2010. He and Tommy Lee decided to fly into the festival on a helicopter and land on festival grounds. The promoters freaked out about it and banned both him and Tommy Lee from the festival, though Dead Mouse did still play his set. Here's a clip of Dead Mouse and Tommy Lee recalling the incident. The only time I saw you mad was at, uh, oh my god, was at, uh, 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 the promoter who shall not be named at Coachella. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Toilet? Yeah. <laughs> Toilet, whatever his name was. Remember, that was insane. That was funny. Unbelievable. I've never seen anybody so angry with I know. me. And, and you. It's but I do. We had no reason to be that pissed. I know. Dude, what? We just landed a helicopter in the middle of a field with a burning van. Yeah, Chill. Yeah, yeah, no big deal, dude. No people around. Yeah, he was tripping. I suppose Joel's relationship with the festival promoters has been mended because he returned to play the festival in 2023. Speaking of controversy, here's a fun little story about something that happened in Las Vegas in 2011. Deadmau5 was scheduled to play a set at XS Nightclub in Las Vegas, a gig which his agent Joel Zimmerman had booked for him. Yes, Deadmau5's agent shares the exact same name as him, they're both Joel Zimmerman, just different people. I'll just refer to him as Agent Zimmerman. So Agent Zimmerman had a meeting with Jesse Waits, who is a co-owner of XS Nightclub. Waits introduced a man by the name of Don Johnson to Agent Zimmerman. Don Johnson was a well-known client who would often spend up to half a million dollars a night at the establishment. Don Johnson told Agent Zimmerman that he would pay Deadmau5 $200,000 to play a Bon Jovi song during his upcoming gig at XS. Deadmau5 agreed, and while he was playing the song, he flashed visuals on the screen that said Don motherfucking Johnson, while Don Johnson got up on stage and danced next to Deadmau5. <laughs> After the gig, Agent Zimmerman went to collect the money from Don Johnson, but Don was playing blackjack and losing pretty bad, so Don refused to pay and a whole bunch of drama happened which resulted in a lawsuit, but Deadmau5 did ultimately get the $200,000, just not from Don Johnson. In 2011, Deadmau5 held a contest in partnership with Talent House where fans got the opportunity to design a new mouse head and the winning design would go on to be used at gigs and promotional events. The winning design was called the Cheese Head, designed by Lance Thackeray, and the head was debuted at a performance in New York City at Rosalind Ballroom, and as a tribute to the design, Deadmau5 played his track The Reward is Cheese in the set. The following year in 2012, Deadmau5 got the opportunity to be on the cover of The Rolling Stone, which he wore the cheese head for. He also released a few singles that year, one of which was with Gerard Way, who is the lead singer of My Chemical Romance and the creator of The Umbrella Academy on Netflix. Another one of the singles from that year, The Velt, was created over the course of a 22-hour live stream, and it had a very interesting story. The song was inspired by a 1950 short story by Ray Bradbury, which was also called The Velt. Chris James recorded vocals that referenced the short story, and he tweeted them at Deadmau5, and Deadmau5 ended up loving them, so he decided to use them in the official release. Lindsay, come here and listen to this. Holy shit. I am fucking impressed right here. This guy did vocals for this track. Well, like, from my SoundCloud thing? Tell me what you think of this. The song did very well, and it landed a spot on the Rolling Stones' top 50 songs in 2012. A little over a month after the release, Deadmau5 posted a music video for the song on his YouTube channel, which also pays homage to the short story, but unfortunately Ray Bradbury died just weeks before the video was published, so he never got to see it. Deadmau5 is also a part owner in Veld Music Festival, which takes place in Toronto, and it was named after the song, and it also launched the same year that the song was released. 
Deadmau5 also released his sixth studio album in 2012 called Album Title Goes Here, and the cover art features the typical mouse head, but with his cat Meowingtons, also known as Professor Meowingtons, as the face. Meowingtons has been featured on the cover art for a few other singles as well, and is highly revered by the Dead Mouse fan base. There was actually supposed to be an animated project called Meowingtons and Mouse, but it was scrapped because it was too expensive to produce, though a pilot episode does exist. What are you smiling at? Meow Five. <laughs> what a ridiculous name. Meowingtons had his own OnlyFans page, which is where the pilot was uploaded, but unfortunately the page no longer exists. Meowingtons was also in the middle of a legal battle that lasted three years from 2015 to 2018. Joel attempted to register a trademark for the name Meowingtons, but it was rejected due to it already being owned by an online cat-themed retailer also called Meowingtons. Two years later in 2017, the company sued Joel for trademark infringement, stating that the business didn't get the name from Joel's cat. The suit was eventually settled with the help of Joel's super lawyer named Dina. The owner of the company was dating a DJ, so Dina asked the owner if her boyfriend knew who Deadmau5 was, to which she said no. Dina did some sleuthing and uncovered a picture of the owner's boyfriend DJing with a Deadmau5 track loaded up on the CDJs, so they quickly came to a settlement after that. Unfortunately, Meowingtons peacefully passed away in 2023 after 16 years of stardom. He may be gone, but his legacy as the pinnacle of kitty achievement lives on in the hearts of Dead Mouse fans around the world. Now, we still have to talk about the stunt that Dead Mouse pulled at the 54th Grammy Awards in 2012. Deadmau5 has been known to be quite a troll, so it was no surprise when Deadmau5 wore a t-shirt to the Grammys that had Skrillex's actual phone number on it. He knew his management wouldn't approve of the stunt, so he swapped shirts at the very last minute before going onto the red carpet, which resulted in Skrillex's phone becoming essentially disabled by how fast texts and calls were coming in. As frustrating as that probably was, Skrillex was the one who got the last laugh by taking home three Grammys that night, while Deadmau5 got none, and still to this day has never won one, while Skrillex has continued to rack them up. And the Grammy goes to uh, Sonny Moore for Cinema Skrillex Remix. And the Grammy goes to... Where are you now, Skrillex and Diplo with Justin Bieber? What do you mean Justin Bieber's new record is fire? The Grammy goes to... Skrillex and Fred again and Flo Dan. Let's be honest, winning a Grammy doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things anyways, it's mostly just industry giants getting a pat on the back. Full throttle. Good, we're catching them. Keep going, man. Keep going. And brake. Brake hard up to that green cone. Okay, now turn in. Off the brake. Keep turning. Tighter. Tighter. Oh, these things and really go. turn. Full throttle. Right? I just, you know, I'm getting used to it, but... Over to the right. Now let's take a break from the music for a second to dive into Joel's love for supercars. He actually didn't get his driver's license until he was 32 years old, which happened back in 2013. He had to make up for lost time, so his supercar obsession was born. He purchased a white McLaren and signed up to be an Uber driver for a day in Toronto. I feel very safe. Am I doing this right? How old is your cat? I think he's like uh, seven or eight. Really? Yeah, yeah, he's getting up there. He then purchased a Ferrari, which he decked out with Neon Cat customization, calling it the Ferrari. He swapped the classic Ferrari horse logo for a cat, and even changed all of the Ferrari emblems to Ferrari. He did all of this to enter the car into the Gumball 3000 rally, which is a supercar rally that takes place on multiple continents. Welcome to the 2015 Gumball 3000. Our driver is Canadian music producer Dead Mouse, and he'll be racing along in his ultra fast McLaren P1. What could possibly go wrong? He had his driver's license suspended in France during the 2014 Gumball 3000. We're heading to Spain. We made it all the way through France, and then all of a sudden there's a motorcycle cop on our tail, and he lights us up. Joel had his wallet stolen or it got lost in Miami, so he doesn't have a driver's license. We had to go to the police station, and they agreed to let us get out of the country. However, Joel was not allowed to drive Iowa. 
Once Ferrari got news of his modifications, they sent him a cease and desist letter as they take the preservation of their brand very seriously. Lamborghini got wind of what had happened, so they reached out to Joel encouraging him to buy a new Lamborghini Huracan and customize it however he wanted. Joel decided that this was a great idea, and the fully customized Neon Cat Huracan was born. Around the time that he got his driver's license, he had started uploading videos of him and his friends conversing while on the way to get coffee. He called the series Coffee Run, and it was almost an informal podcast of sorts, which of course was just Joel being ahead of the curve once again. The series had a plethora of guests such as Dylan Francis, Steve Duda, his lawyer Dina, Getter, and many others. So as you can see, cars became a big part of his life as soon as he got his driver's license, and he still participates in the Gumball 3000 every year. In 2014, Deadmau5 launched his side project called Test Pilot by releasing a single called Sunspot White Space Conflict. He's been playing Test Pilot sets every now and then ever since, but he hasn't released any more music under the name. I heard a rumor that Test Pilot got both the Detroit Electronic Music Festival. It's just a rumor. What's Test Pilot? Wow. What's Test Pilot? Wow. Okay, someone else answer me then. Are you fucking serious? You've never heard of Test Pilot. You've really never heard of that guy. No. No. That same year, he released his seventh studio album, While One Is Less Than Two, which was his final album before his 2015 hiatus scare, but we'll get to that in a bit. 2014 was also the year that Deadmau5 got caught up in what would eventually become an iconic lawsuit that is now discussed in law school textbooks. This came about when Disney filed a trademark against Deadmau5 for his iconic mouse head, claiming that it closely resembles Mickey Mouse. Ironically, Disney had previously illegally used the song Ghosts and Stuff in one of their animations without ever buying a license, to which Joel called them out on. Eventually, the lawsuit was, quote, amicably resolved, though Joel had to spend a tremendous amount of cheese on legal fees just to make it go away. Now, around the time that the lawsuit was settled, Deadmau5 got himself into some more of his signature internet drama. It all started when he and Steve Duda were approached by Razer to be a part of a video series promoting producers using Razer computers. Hey, it's Steve Duda here. I'm with Joel, and we're back to talk just kind of talk shop and rap about uh, being creative, making music, and uh, kind of what that's like, or, you know. Yeah, it's like my Twitter feed, but with less swearing. One of the other artists who was a part of the series was Carnage, who is now known as Gordo. In Carnage's video, he appears to have no idea what he is doing, giving unintelligible explanations for his production process. It just adds a whole, I don't know what it does, it just makes everything super louder, so compared to that to it just, yeah, it just really adds like a whole, it just makes it sound very, very way much stronger. Very, very way much stronger. Way much stronger. was rightfully horrified by the video and didn't want to be associated with Carnage whatsoever, so he brought up the issue to Razor. Lennar Digital, who's the company who makes the synth called Silent One, got in on the action when they noticed that Carnage was using a pirated version of the synth in his tutorial video, which led to Razor dropping him from the series. Carnage took issue with Deadmau5, and he was waiting for an opportunity to retaliate. Eventually, they both were booked for the same festival on the same stage, with only a 30-minute gap in between their sets. After Carnage's set ended, he waited around for 30 minutes so that he could film himself confronting Deadmau5. Deadmau5 had already anticipated this, so he let No Mana, a longtime mousetrap artist, play a 20 minute set before he went on in order to give himself even more of a buffer. However, this didn't stop Carnage, and when it was finally time for Deadmau5 to go on stage, Carnage sprung into action. He tried to confront Deadmau5, even pushing a security guard to get to him, which ended poorly as he was handled by a swarm of security guards, and Deadmau5 just went on to play his set. You're a fucking pussy, Deadmau5! Oh, brother, this guy stinks! 
And since we're already talking about pirated synths, let's talk about the time that Kanye West was caught pirating Serum, the synth that was created by Joel's longtime friend Steve Duda. In 2016, Kanye tweeted a picture of him listening to a song on YouTube, and in the picture he had a pirate bass Serum tab open. Deadmau5 called him out on Twitter saying, what the fuck Kanye, can't afford Serum, dick. It clearly got under Kanye's skin as he rattled off seven tweets at Deadmau5 back to back to back to back to back to back to back. In 2015, Jack U and Justin Bieber had taken the world by storm with their massive track, Where Are You Now? Deadmau5 didn't like it, so he took to Twitter with some choice words, but things got really funny when he decided to upload his remix of the song using an awful sounding recorder for the drop. Where are you now that I need you? It's pretty unclear what prompted him to pick a fight over the song, though I think his beef may have been mostly fueled by Justin Bieber more than Skrillex or Diplo, because it wouldn't be the first time that he had an issue with his fellow Canadian superstar. One fine day, and a, an 18-year-old Bieber fucking appears. And I was like, oh, I really didn't want to be there. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, fuck, they're going to have cameras. So we were just sitting there, and he fucking, like, just... You know, takes off his shirt and all this shit. He's like 18. Dude, you're not even legally allowed to be there for starters, you know, but who's going to say shit, right? So I was just like, whatever, you know. And he fucking looks over me. He's like... And then uh, he's like fucking... He, I don't know. He was like, you know, so we'll tell him to come here. You know, I'm like, no. You know, like, I'm not going to walk over to your booth and go over there, right? And then I... And <laughs> that's so a, I that's leaned a... over and someone took a picture of me leaning over <laughs> to tell him and not say, like, hey, I'm your biggest fan. I actually said, hey, welcome to Canada. First time. It's just the way that they caught me in the photo. Looks like I'm, like, reaching <laughs> like you're for fanboying. it. Like I'm fanboying or something. I will admit, I didn't look that good at 18. Yeah, yeah. He does look good. He he, he definitely took he care of his care body. Himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You know, I was thinking the other. I wouldn't be taking my shirt off. <laughs> no, no. Is this the only time you guys have have crossed paths? That's it. Oh no, 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 no. Oh, oh shit, Dean. Do we still have the? Oh, I don't know if we have a picture of it, but fucking, uh, he he threatened to kill me. He wrote on uh his like a picture of himself. Hi, Deb Mouse. I will kill you. <laughs> I'm dead fucking serious. Was this after and gave this? it to Rooks and then said, give that to Dead Mouse, right? And then so Rooks came to me with this fucking photo and says, here, you know, Justin Bieber want me to give you this. He also had some Twitter beef with Justin back in 2013, so here's the backstory. As we discussed earlier, Dead Mouse is a big car guy, so he was a big fan of the show called Top Gear. He really wanted to get on the show, so he ran a Twitter campaign having his fans tweet at Top Gear so that it would start trending and ultimately end up getting Joel on the show. However, the day of the Twitter campaign, the infamous picture of Dead Mouse and Justin Bieber surfaced on the internet, which buried Joel's attempts to get on the show, and he blamed Justin for it. As frustrating as that may have been, he had bigger problems to deal with that year. Remember earlier in the video when we talked about Play Records, Melly Fresh's record label? Well, in 2015, Dead Mouse sued them for $10 million for releasing unauthorized remixes of his early music, as well as early unreleased tracks that lacked good technical and commercial quality. The lawsuit asserted a breach of contract because his agreement with Play Records stated that they had to get prior consent from Joel before releasing any new remixes. His relationship with the label turned sour nearly a decade earlier in 2007 when he paid to get out of the contract in order to sign with a different management firm, which ended up being a good career move. The lawsuit came to a close in 2016 when Deadmau5 and Play Records reached a settlement where Play Records could no longer create new remixes or mashups, but they retained rights to more than 100 Deadmau5 tracks created between 2006 and 2008. Even though the lawsuit was supposedly amicably resolved, Deadmau5 still appears to be bitter about their relationship, which is a reasonable way to feel about your former record label potentially tarnishing your brand for their own gain. So with all of that out of the way, let's get back to the part about people thinking that Dead Mouse was going to take a hiatus. In December of 2015, he deleted his Facebook and Twitter, leaving people to speculate on whether or not Dead Mouse was taking a break or possibly ending his career forever. However, four days later, he reopened his Twitter account and posted an apology saying that he was struggling with depression and that he would be back to making music the following year. It was never made clear if the whirlwind of lawsuits with Disney and Play Records were contributing factors in his depression, but I would imagine that they at least played a part. 
As promised, the following summer he released his first single in nearly two years, called Snow Cone. It was later announced that Snow Cone would be the first track from his upcoming album, W2016 album, which was released at the end of 2016. Though roughly a month before the release, the greatest Dead Mouse meme of all time was born, the Dead Mouse Masterclass. This is a cardinal sin of EDM, right? This is a cardinal sin of EDM right here. This is a cardinal sin of EDM right here. So a fun little fact about Masterclass is that it's actually owned by Christina Aguilera's husband, and Dead Mouse disclosed the process of filming it when he appeared on Mr. Bill's podcast in 2020. It took us a solid seven days of filming. Like That's it wasn't not some long. fucking chop shop crew. They literally like turned my entire house into a post unit. Wow. Like, I, like fuck, my living room had fucking huge post lab, fucking catering in the <clears throat> kitchen. There was about 25 fucking grips. Like it was really, it was fucking movie tier Damn, those production. 20, so Masterclass sent 25 people out to your house. Oh, at least, at least they took over like my whole house. Like my, my fucking laundry room was a fucking color correction, fucking <laughs> sweet. Where did they it, stay? It was, did they all stay at your house or did they stay other places? Uh, yeah. Hotel. Hotel, right. Yeah, and then they just came in, and then we had, like, catering trucks and all that fucking shit. And I'm thinking, like, I thought they were just going to send a guy with a DLSR and fucking... Mm. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, say, say the line, Bart. <laughs> fucking, this is a cardinal sin of EDM or fucking whatever. But, uh, it, yeah, no, it, it was a big fucking deal. It was really well done, so... If you watched any YouTube videos of anything related to electronic music in 2016 through maybe 2018 or 2019, you absolutely could not escape this ad. Even Deadmau5 himself was bombarded with these ads, so much so that he actually decided to buy YouTube Premium just to get away from it. Hang on. Yeah, I think it was... Yeah, it was this. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a car. God damn it! Right For his first release of 2017, he put out a compilation album called Stuff I Used To Do, which contained 13 tracks that he had produced between 1998 and 2007. Later that year, he released a hip-hop track with Shoddy Horo called Legendary, which was a bit of a departure from the houseier Deadmau5 tracks. He also began experimenting with Unreal Engine that year, which has since become his go-to method for building out his stage designs in a budget-friendly way. Normally, the way that artists build stages for their tours is by renting a massive warehouse and physically building and testing the stage in the time frame that they reserved the warehouse for, and it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this, so Deadmau5 saves a tremendous amount of money by being able to do it all digitally. Here's a clip from a Twitch stream where he goes into a little bit more detail about why he taught himself 3D modeling. No, I am not great at everything. I am mediocre at everything. But it's good to have an understanding of everything, even if you're not good at it, like to have an understanding of it. Because as a musician or performer, boy, do I save fucking money because it's like, you know, uh, I, can, I can have quick, faster conversations with people uh, or, con or people that need to work on the show or people like content designers and stuff like that. I can tell them exactly what they need to fucking do. You know what I mean? And, and know exactly their language. You know what I mean? And, and get things done. Cause I can, I can't imagine the stress that most like, uh, you know, performers or people who need these kind of assets in their lives have conversations with other or digital artists. And they're like, what? You know what I mean? Whatever, dude. Just shut your idiot DJ mouth up. Uh, we're going to charge you 80 fucking grand for some trap code presets. And you're going to fucking pay that because you don't even know. You know what I mean? So, and it's true. And it's actually happened. It, I, that is actually a fun fact that, you know, someone has paid a stupid amount of money for some fucking guy to go into fucking After Effects, run fucking Red Giant plugins on a bunch of bullshit, and then charge the dude, like, 50 fucking grand for, like, you know, some dumb shit. And then when they got it back, it was the most mind-blowing fucking thing they've ever seen. It happens all the fucking time. 
The following year in 2018, he released an album called Where's the Drop, which features former Deadmau5 tracks turned into orchestral compositions. It was only available on Tidal for the first three months before it then hit other DSPs like Spotify and Apple Music. He actually had a live orchestra perform it, which was funded by Tidal, and it cost well over a million dollars to pull off. Which tracks of your music really, I mean, do you enjoy? Not the fans, not... Hmm. Just you. Oh, uh, well, lately, it, it, it would have been my Where's the Drop, because I actually wrote a symphony and nobody knows or cares. <laughs> Well, sure, the fans do. They love it. But um, I, me and Gregory Reverett um, wrote a symphony. I've always wanted to write a symphony. And it's uh, it's an 80-minute long fucking symphony wow. of actual shit. With, with, and it was scored. Uh, um, I did the original score, and then Greg did the transcription. Um, and then it was uh, performed by the Finnick. Uh, which is like an 80-piece uh, orchestra. And we did two shows at the Wiltern Theater in Los Angeles with 80, 80 players. Oh, man. And it's all music you probably wouldn't even know, like, or it's none of my hits, really. Like, maybe some abstractions on some of them, like Monophobia and Avaricia and Imaginary Friends, but they were all, like, super orchestrated. And I – because – I noticed this kind of trend uh, in EDM with the old timers. I like to say that the, the us uh, of dudes that have just kind of taken their classic songs and then had them reimagined by orchestra. But then when I would listen to them, they would they're the same tracks. And good look, it's kick drum in it, and it's all very syncopated, and it still sounded like a dance track just with a really good string section in it. And I was like, nah, I think they need to be. I think this needs to be like a an actual fucking symphony. Like, let's write a fucking. Like, um, uh, I need this. You know what I mean? Like, I want to make music in the way that the, the fucking Prokofsky did back in fucking way back when. Like, do a legitimate orchestra. No no bells and whistles. No, uh, no, here's a symphony playing with some EDM sprinkled on top. No, fuck the EDM. Let's just make M. Very soon after the album release, he released Mouseville Level 1, which featured a collab with Rob Swire, as well as original tracks from Getter and GTA, now known as Good Times Ahead. Later that year, he announced that he was in the process of producing his first ever film score, which was something that he had wanted to do for a long time, but he was waiting for the right opportunity to come along. To close out the year, he released Mouseville Level 2, which had collaborations with Lights and Mr. Bill. On January 25th, 2019, Polar, the movie which Dead Mouse had scored, was released on Netflix and the soundtrack was released on Mousetrap. Just days after the movie premiere, Mouseville Level 3 was released, this time with collaborations with Shoddy Horo and Scene of Action, as well as original tracks from No Mana and COZ. To close out the year, he released three tracks in November of 2019. Saturn, Coasted, and Fall. In 2020, he collaborated with the Neptunes on the track Pomegranate, as well as a collaboration with Kaiza called Bridged by a Light Wave. Both of those tracks are expected to appear on the next Dead Mouse album, but it's unclear when that's going to be released. In 2021, Mousetrap launched a new house music imprint called House Trap, and Dead Mouse released a single called Nextra soon after. He followed that up with his first ever collaboration with Rez called Hypnocurrency, followed by When the Summer Dies with Lights. In 2022, Dead Mouse and Cascade teamed up to form K5. They released a single called Escape, then proceeded to sell out the LA Memorial Coliseum, netting $3.7 million. They released the full K5 album in 2023, which received a Grammy nomination. I like just this and controlling this and mm -hmm. being my own artist right. and doing yeah. my own things on my own time and through my own volition as opposed to working as a team and collab bro collab it's like mm -hmm. why is collaborating so fucking huge with mainstream music i don't under fucking stand it you know like well, get you more get you more views yeah get you more views, exposure. sales exposure yeah. right but it doesn't it doesn't attribute anything to it other than that you know it doesn't make the product better it doesn't make it sometimes it makes it's it the nature fucking of the beast, worse right? like, yeah that's what i mean i'm like well fuck man think about like all the really the, 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 the great music from back in the you know the 60s 70s rock bands and all that right. shit and it's like edgar winter did not collaborate with Led Zeppelin <laughs> right. to do this. Yeah. They, they all had their own vehicles. That's what it's about. 
Dead Mouse also made a return to Netflix in 2022 when he produced the song My Heart Has Teeth for Resident Evil. As far as the latest news for Dead Mouse, he recently announced his retrospective tour, which will be celebrating 20 years of Dead Mouse. He also recently posted a video on Instagram of him working with LA hip hop group Coast Contra, so it appears that new music is on the way, but we'll just have to wait and see. Dead Mouse has made it remarkably far from his record shop days, and he's made it clear that he intends to let off the gas of the Dead Mouse project so that he can be free to enjoy life in whatever ways seems fitting to him. I'm totally like at peace with this being like my sunset years. Like I'm 40 fucking two, you know, like that's not far off from 50. And you think I'm gonna be wearing fucking mouse head at fucking 50, you know, like hanging under the dream, you know, no, I'm probably, I'll, I'll be in the space, but I just, you know, yeah. I won't be, as mousy. I'm not retiring, but I will slow down the shows a little bit. When he's not doing music, computer, or car stuff, he enjoys taking life easy at home on his 50-acre farm outside of Toronto. I have eggs and toast every morning uh, from our three chickens. He even has an Instagram where he posts pictures of his farm animals, and if you want to follow it, the handle is called Epic Fail Farm. He also owns a Chicago-based production company that rents out stage equipment to artists, festivals, promotion companies, etc. So it's actually highly likely that you've been to a non-dead mouse show with LED boards and stage equipment that was actually supplied by Dead Mouse. I do own a large production company in Chicago where we supply a lot of LED products, stage design, lights, all that shit for big festivals and solo acts and stuff like that. He also recently struck up a brand deal with his friend's company called Coco Vodka. It's a coconut vodka drink sold in four packs of cans with a white version of the mouse head on each can and it's sold at liquor stores all over the world. Dead Mouse has been a massive contributor to the world of electronic music in far more ways than he receives credit for. He has introduced the world to many groundbreaking artists, produced timeless tracks that will be remembered for a very long time, and has been one of the main flag bearers for the modern age of electronic music. This is, and always will be, the legacy of Dead Mouse. You know, like these fucking obligatory like house music songs where like it's like always a kick and then on the downbeat there's like a snare or a clap or yeah. something like that well what i do is i take an sm57 or whatever i got handy and i go and i literally smack my ass into the mic and then just layer it and then i use it and i put it in the fucking track oh that's pretty cool it is kind of neat because it, it's so that, it's a little bit of me no that's not why. Well, I don't film myself doing it. I just do it. Like in the, the it. privacy of my own home. And it's hilarious because everybody wants those natural, like, sounding hand claps. So instead, I just, you know, cut my ass and get that really nice, thick, loud one. That's your secret? That's my secret. <laughs>